Welcome, everyone. Um, it's really a great pleasure to welcome tonight Nieto Sobeano. Uh, and there are many ways to uh, sort of understand their incredible practice. And I think one of the maybe most interesting ways to understand it is a practice that's really committed to, to competitions. Um, in many ways, the office is like a school. It's a research practice that's always pushing the boundaries of its own work and therefore encouraging new ways of thinking and, and evolving the field as it uh, kind of produces new projects. There are many consequences to uh, a competition-based approach as a mode of practice. First, the work and practice is conceptual in the sense that Nieto Sobeano engages with what they have termed an economics of the conceptual, a sort of resistance to over-designing things. Designs are based uh, conceptually only often on a few building elements and then repeated uh, and combined in different ways, exploring different possibilities uh, in a kind of echoing of, of life itself with atoms and cells kind of repeated over and over again. Second, the research is really uh, uh, kind of ongoing and evolves the work continuously in very beautiful ways. And more recently, a kind of evolution that has moved the work from sort of object-like buildings, uh, which many of the projects seemed uh, early on in their sort of career, to much more open system geometries that don't really have a predetermined form, but really engage in research uh, into fabrication, materials, light effects, and incredibly textured and sensuous environments and experiences uh, with a unique combination of sort of horizontal monumentality uh, that is at once very accessible but also elegant and, and somewhat removed. Third, I would say that the competitions, and especially the ones that uh, Santi and Enrique have engaged in, have the ability to often introduce a kind of hidden or secret agenda that's sort of, when you don't have the negotiation with the client, you can sort of think bigger. And in the case of, of Nieto Sobeano, that engagement really has resulted in a sort of commitment to public space, always finding a way to, as they have said, add something extra to the environment, even if it hasn't been requested, one may have a positive impact on the urban environment and the life of the citizens. And I think that that dimension is often enabled uh, by competitions. Uh, fourth, I would say competitions has led the practice to become uh, quite global, even though their practice is really based in Madrid and Berlin. And that, uh, uh, whereas Often you, there's a sense that a sort of global practice can be at times producing quote unquote global architecture in a sort of superficial uh, sort of landing uh, for a little moment away and then flying uh, out. Uh, I think their practice uh, has demonstrated that coming from the outside at times allow a very interesting reading of a site, a history or a context and revealing that uh, history in ways that you couldn't, you couldn't if you were from within. The, the, the kind of estrangement of, of, of the gaze can work uh, really in a kind of positive uh, way. Um, but all of this, of course, is not just a result of uh, a competition mode of practice, I can assure you that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, more, but rather the result of the practice winning uh, at least one major building competition almost every year since 1995. I think that that in itself is, a, is an incredible uh, and, and very difficult kind of record. Amongst some of the, uh, the projects and winning entries is the Contemporary Art Center in Cordoba, uh, which won the iconic awards in 2015, the Best Architects Award in 2016, and the Mies van der Rohe Award uh, also in 2015, the Medina de Zahra Museum, uh, the, which won uh, numerous awards as well, such as the European Museum of the Year Award of 2012 uh, and the Piranesi Prix de Rome of 2011, as well as the Mies van der Rohe Award in 2011 and the Aga Khan Award for Archi uh, Architecture in 2010. Um, other competitions, winning competitions and buildings include El Madin Art Museum in Marrakesh, the Contemporary Art Center in Cordoba, the History Museum in Lugo, Spain, the San Tamo Museum in San Sebastian, Spain, the Aragon Convention Center, the Morrisburg Museum 
Halle, uh, and currently they have projects in Germany, Spain, Austria, Estonia, Morocco, China, and the United Kingdom. Uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting a country, but you will correct us, uh, I hope. And they've just been awarded uh, the Sorolla Museum expansion uh, in Madrid. They've won too many awards uh, uh, for me to stay here tonight, but the, uh, one of the kind of most recent important one is the Alvaro Alto Medal uh, uh, in 2015. They've been exhibited uh, uh, all over the world and published in, uh, in many uh, magazines and, and, and books and international kind of publications. Also been exhibited uh, at the Venice Biennale numerous times, at MoMA, at the Kunsthaus in Graz uh, in 2008, and at the Mast Foundation in Bologna in 2014, amongst other places. Uh, Enrique Sobeiano teaches at the Universität der Kunst in uh, Berlin, but Last but not least, and maybe most importantly, uh, uh, Santi and Enrique are, um, are alumni uh, from the school, uh, and, uh, and they, they graduated, uh, and some of their faculty is here, and they graduated from GSAP in 1983, and two years later uh, founded what has become one of the most uh, interesting uh, practices operating today and quite inspiring. So please uh, welcome uh, Nieto Sobeano. Hello, good evening. Thank you very much, Amal. Thank you very much for everything, for the presentation, for asking us to come here. Of course, we are being alumni here. It's always special to come. It's not the first time that we are here after, being, after, after having studied here, but it always, it's a wonderful memory. I mean, when we are here, we look backwards and we remember the time that we were here. And I have to tell you as students, that is wonderful. You have to enjoy it, even if it's, even if it's sometimes it looks hard and you have to work a lot. It's the best time of your life, I think. So <laughs> enjoy it as much as you can. I think anyway that we have come in a bad day today because it's the presidential debate. We know that is the presidential debate at nine o'clock. We have a, a, a lot of images, so we are going to try to be really quick so that you can go to see the presidential debate. <laughs> we are, sorry. Ah, sorry. Um, the last time that we were here, we were speaking basically in, in our involvement in, in uh, already built buildings, which of course is a lot because we, uh, we are going to see all, also maybe some of the same buildings because we do a lot of, of uh, architecture of already built buildings. But we have tried now to uh, try to explain uh, our way of thought or what really makes us think or triggers our imagination in every one of the buildings that we work. Uh, you see the name of the lecture is Denk Builder, which means something like the thought of a mind, images that are thoughts. And uh, everyone, so we are trying to show you the images that start our imagination when we are working in a project. Uh, of course, we, we take this, this uh, we borrow this name from Father Benjamin, but this idea of an image that is also a thought has been always constantly in our mind. Uh, so, uh, and some of them come back and forth uh, one way and another. The idea of the mirror, yeah? the idea of the mirror explains very, very much this idea of repetition, difference and repetition. Uh, the idea uh, that every project is a mirror of another one. It is somehow uh, something that relates also to the interior world to, to our own subjective world that is always present in our projects. And this is uh, back and forth uh, coming uh, in, our, in our architecture for many reasons. What you see here is a part of a partiture of a great uh, composer, Arbor Part, the Estonian composer. It's also about Spiegel in Spiegel or mirrors in a mirror. It, the, the same composition that maybe you will listen later when we present the project we are doing for him, uh, it's very much about a circular way of understanding that only three notes can repeat and repeat and repeat. So repetition, mirror, uh, it has to do definitely with combinatorial thinking. It has to do also with variations in the beautiful way that uh, Maxfield shows these uh, 15 variations and relates therefore to another thought, which is 
geometry, yeah? in the sense that geometry is this instrument that we constantly use. Um, geometry, and by chance, and this is everything we do at the end, is chance of, of getting involved in, in projects in, in different countries, it became also uh, important to us uh, in the very moment we started to work in the in several projects in Spain that were linked to the Arab culture. You know, the Arab culture in Spain is so powerful and long in history. And all these uh, so-called masharabias, mukarnas, geometrical patterns that appear to be complex and at the end are extremely simple, they're only variations of the same thing, uh, became another image which is also a thought, which is scale. Because what you see here, at the end is a very small detailing that you see in Alhambra, in Cordoba, in so many places in North Africa, and that uh, eventually can talk about another way of understanding them, which is at the end what takes us to this finally clearly always present idea of, of the space, maybe also being Spaniards, <coughs> the whole uh, <coughs> perception of the material, uh, including the space inside, or the negative space that Chiyida or Teiza the great Spanish masters uh, of sculpture constantly express this space in between or this interstitial space. All of them are uh, uh, sort of these tempera, images that uh, trigger uh, the, the project. But in each of the projects we're going to show, and we're going to show quite a lot, so we're going to be quickly, because simply to transmit a sort of biography of our own. No? Since you are, many of you are there in the same place we were sitting, uh, quite a lot of years ago. It is interesting also to see. <laughs> it, is, it is also, I see Professor Franklin there, so uh, uh, it might be, he might remember that at the time we were sitting there. Uh, anyway, uh, the projects we're going to show, and this was a, um, a, a, a synthesis we did for a recent exhibition at the Royal Academy in London, where a piece explains this idea of the variations of a single thing explains the idea of the negative, explains the idea of combinatorial. So each project we're presenting starts with these images. These images are not simply an analogy. These images, in a way, uh, are a poetic uh, uh, way of starting a project that eventually uh, informs the whole process. And this is what we'd like you to, to transmit by explaining in detail some of these projects. So the first of these images is this beautiful painting of uh, Feininger. Feininger was an expressionist paint painter that lived for a time in the, in the Morrisburg Castle in the city of Halle. The city of Halle is uh, an old city with a very nice small old center in the uh, East Germany. And uh, very near this center, this old center, there is the Morrisburg Castle. The Morrisburg Castle that was built in the 15th century, but that had a very short time, a, a short life, sorry, because it was nearly uh, destroyed in the war of uh, uh, 30 years, and two of its wings were never rebuilt. So. This image of the ruin is an image that has been taken to the paintings and is also part of the collection of the, what is now the Morrisburg Museum. This is the image that we saw when we first went to see the place in which we were going to work. And of course, we had to understand that the ruin, as we saw it when we got there, was important because it was linked to the city. And at the same time, the other two wings, we were going to rebuild two of the wings, the other two wings were already done, and they had this image with these um, very special roofs. But for us, it was important, the painter of Feininger. Feininger painting the city of Halle. Uh, these roofs, and also, in another paintings, the whole city. For us, this image, this very special geometry, and these very uh, precise cuts that we saw uh, in his paintings were for us a new way of looking to this old city. So what we decided to do was simply a new roof landscape. A new roof landscape that through its shape and material was going to link both to the geometry and to the uh, roofs of the city of Halle. The roof was, at the same time, structure. So the extension of the building was a box, boxes that were hanging from the roof, from the, st from the structural roof. And in that way, in the section you can see that we can free completely the new wing of any column inside. So in the inside, we could still keep 
this image of the ruin, these old walls uh, um, repaired, and uh, the new architecture creating these interstitial spaces in a way of a dialogue between the old and the new. The new uh, areas were uh, for the contemporary art and were always linked to the light from above, from one of the skylights from the new roof. Of course, once that we have taken a decision that we were going to work with that kind of geometry, all the other decisions that were, we need to take in a project came, uh, came, regarding, I mean, came in relation to this first one. Of course, with what material could we build here? Uh, we, needed, uh, we needed to look around and we wanted to be very careful with the color that we were choosing. Uh, Halle has sometimes these white, uh, uh, these white uh, skies, so we wanted to be able that the uh, roof could fit in these skies. But at the same time, we needed a material that would allow us to build a roof with those very crisp cast cuts. And of course, the material that we selected was plates, aluminum plates, that would give us these cuts and could allow us to work with that geometry. Um, well, this is part of our office that uh, we went for an excursion to the roof when it was still possible to go up there. And we always like to see, like to see the, the human figure in relation uh, to the building because like that you can really experiment scale. But more important for us in this case is this image of the roofs and the relation to the city of, to the old city of Halle. This is the painting of uh, uh, Feininger that he painted in do of those roofs behind there. And uh, this other painting in relation also to the new tower that we built in the situation of an old one that was, had completely disappeared. Another one of these images that started for us the next project, it's uh, this image of uh, a landscape. And it's a landscape that it's in the middle of a city and it's really belonging to the border between the built area and the, uh, and the natural area. This is the city of San Sebastian in the north of Spain. You can see what beautiful borders and beautiful connection to the sea the city has. And it's in that place uh, where we were going to act or to work by extending the museum and convent of San Telmo. Here you see one of these very special situations. It's a city that, have been, that has kept a natural space, the Mount Urgul, completely untouched. This is the place in which we are working in that border between the natural and the urban. And I want to point out also that this has been happening always in the city. This is an old image of the city, a city that was completely, the old San Sebastian that was completely burned. And when it was rebuilt, what was amazing for us is that also the nature was kept and the Mount Urgul was untouched. So we had to work in this interstitial space between the convent and the mountain. And we decided to do it by two inhabited walls. Two walls that are going to establish the new dialogue between the urban and the natural. And going at the same time through its geometry, we're also going to establish the relation with the old convent. Maybe we understand it better in the floor plan in which we see that uh, the geometry of the new building is answering to the, or responding to the geometry of the old one in a sense that we are creating a patio, a courtyard where there is an old cloister and we are creating a long area where we have the nave of the church. And the building only touches the old one in three points in order to uh, organize well the circulation. Of course, the very important thing here was the new facade, the new facade that was going to establish the new relation with the mountain and at the same time that dialogue with the old building. So for this, we went to see the mountain. We took walks around the Mount Urgul and we saw this situation of the, these holes in the rock created by erosion and the greenery coming out. We wanted to translate this situation to our own building. So we uh, worked with um, cast aluminum panels, 
with perforations, and from those perforations, also the greenery was going to come out. We worked in this facade with two wonderful artists, Leopoldo Ferran and Agustina Otero, living in San Sebastián. Here we are trying to understand how the greenery was going to come out in a model of one of the panels of the facade. Uh, uh, of course, when we see the building in the distance, we see it as a whole building. Uh, the, also, the facade was studied to look as if it as if was one single drawing. When we get near it, we understand that it has different layers. And we get even more near, we can see that the facade really is composed by, is formed, done by the combination of five different panels. And through this combination of the different panels, we can organize them in a way that they look as if it is one single drawing. The facade also has different layers. One of it, as I said before, is for the greenery that is coming out. A second one is when we need to introduce the natural light in the building. And the third one, the opposite one, is during the night, when the facade becomes also the lighting of the building. Working in this interstitial space is, was complicated and it also gave us uh, difficulties because it was very narrow. So this very narrow geometry translates to the inside of the building. Uh, this is a new uh, exhibition area that it relates to the old convent through this long horizontal cut. And at the same time, it has a vertical cut that relates all the other exhibition areas of the building. And during the night, the facade, we, while it's uh, lighted, is really like a new light installation for the city of San Sebastián. Another one of these images that was important for us and that started, out, started our thoughts in the city of Graz, and this, this, uh, this Marcel Duchamp image that is really hypnotic and it looks as if we are looking to the infinite. So when we were in the city of Graz in Austria, we were invited uh, for a competition uh, for the Joanneum um, Institution. The Joanneum Institution owns a lot of buildings. In this case, we were working in these three buildings, the Art Museum, the Science Museum, and the Library. We had to restore them and at the same time to make a big extension of the three of them. So, because we didn't have the space, we wanted to restore the buildings, what we decided to do is to create simply a new plaza, a new plaza for the city that was going to be perforated through a series of cones, and these cones were going to introduce the light and the entrance to the underground building that we built to connect with a new vestibule the two, uh, old, uh, uh, the two already existing buildings. In the second basement, we organized the extension of the library with one million books. The vestibule is organized around uh, the conical areas, and this cone, for us, when we managed, uh, imagine it, it's a one single very big cone, as one infinite cone that is cut in different sections and with different inclinations. And by that way, we managed to always have the same geometry. Here we are in the exterior, and the big ones introduce or make the entrance to the building. And another important thing for us, as you have already seen, I guess, is the dialogue between uh, the old architecture and the new architecture. In this case, we work with it uh, through, the, uh, through the glass, because the buildings and the reflection, the old buildings are reflected in the glass, and they give an image at all times of the old inside the new vestibule. The old buildings uh, are now restored and create this uh, unity around the new plaza of the city of Graz. Another image, this beautiful photograph uh, of, taken by Bescher, and it's this photograph of these uh, industrial buildings uh, that for us it was very shocking, especially this structure, or very, more than shocking, I would say, very attractive. So we are in the north of Spain, in the city of Lugo. 
Lugo is a small city that has a small, very beautiful old center, but especially surrounded by very impressive Roman walls. Because it's so quite small, the uh, mayor decided to build a museum in the outskirts of the city and the entrance of the city so that the visitors could have like a reception center in which they were informed of the history of the of the, of the city of Lugo that they were going to see afterwards. So we are working in two different situations. With these walls and an in, in an industrial area that it was the entrance to the city where we were supposed to build the museum. So it was this relation, the walls, and at the same time, the industrial area that we wanted to be reflected in the old building. The building. The building is conceived uh, as a, in, in a combinatorial system as the repetition of a series of cylinders. It's again a buried building because at the same time that we are working with the museum, we also wanted to create a park around it. So the entrance is through these big stairs that lead us to one of the empty cylinders. Seen in the distance, we had a big plot of area in which to work that had a big, a big difference of level. We decided to put the building in the upper level so that uh, the roof of the uh, building that is below could act as the new park that we are going to create. The materials we used were basically corten steel in plates and also corten steel in a transparent plates. In the inside, we had a neutral uh, material in order to be able to have the exhibition of the history of the city. Important for us was the way that we treated uh, the structure the structure, the material that we were using is transparent where the, when the light hits it in a special way. And then the structure is apparent relating to the old industrial site. For us, it's very important the light, both the natural light, which is present in the building at all times, even if it's an underground building. As you see, it enters through the courtyards and at the same time through skylights. The natural light bringing out the structure of the building. And the image of the park. Really, the park is working around the cylinders that also act in a way as the organizers, both at the same time of the outside public, new public space and of the inside space of the new museum. Important for us is always the light the way of, of the light, the natural light coming in the building. In this situation is one of the exhibition areas in which we have another cylinder of light introducing the natural light. The natural light uh, that transforms the building because it's, it allows uh, the structure to come out, but also the artificial light that during the night gives the, the building a completely new image come, resulting out the uh, a structure and linking it to its industrial past. I will continue now with, with this other project. Uh, again, this other image or then build. Actually, this idea of an image that is a thought is much more than simply a metaphor of a building or an analogy. And in this case, uh, particularly because what you see here, it's an archaeological site. This archaeological site is in Syria, where we went with our students of Madrid about almost 20 years ago. It's a place that nowadays, uh, for sure, is impossible to visit for 
very sad reasons. But uh, I bring it here because it, it actually uh, became the very origin of the project that we are going to show, a project that became very important for us, which is the Madinat al Fara Museum for many reasons. We are working in the city of Cordoba. If this is the center of Cordoba, Cordoba in the year 1000 was probably one of the, if not the most important city in Europe at the time of the Arab kingdoms in Spain. Uh, at the time of the Caliphate of Cordoba, this city was built. The city lasted only 70 years, but it was a legend even uh, till the end of the 19th century when nobody was where it was placed. So uh, after the 20th century, the excavations started, and these excavations brought and showed an incredible uh, city that was built at the time of this very powerful uh, kingdom. So, but what do we see nowadays? Uh, uh, ruins uh, transmit so much as it's also for us, I didn't show at the beginning, one of the strongest uh, uh, image thoughts. No? It's, it's not only about the past and the suggestion of what was there, it's about the structure itself that keeps uh, and stays after centuries. It's also about the imagination of how it could be or how we could imagine what it was. So when we went to this place of Ebla, in Syria, I remember that it was you and me with a lot of students of this of school in Spain at the time where, where I was teaching. And uh, I remember to say, uh, well, this is an incredible architecture idea as itself. It's simply uh, taking this grid and uh, eliminating uh, layers and finding uh, the city below. Yeah? But we forgot. Uh, but five or I would say maybe six or eight years later, we entered the competition for the new museum of Madinat al Fara, and then this idea came immediately. This idea of the competitions that was mentioned by uh, Amal before uh, makes you always think that projects somehow are in your memory even before you know. So what you see here are the models of the competition. Uh, 50, 15 years ago, that was 1999, we simply trace all this uh, archaeological ground, we eliminate the layers, and eventually we find the museum, which is what, uh, the way we won the competition. But more than that, and this is what I want to transmit, it's not only a way of winning a competition or having a nice idea to tell. Because the idea became and triggered the whole uh, things that came afterwards. It, it informed the whole process, the relation of material, of structure, of, uh, to, to the actual uh, building itself. So when we uh, show images like this, which is images of the site supervision we did, this is below, of course, and above the archaeologists finding the real ruins as they have been in the last 100 years, and they will be for another 100 years for sure, uh, we, were, we had the image of this uh, mirror image again, this idea of construction, destruction. This idea that uh, if the building had to be found below earth, the only material we could use is concrete, because once we build the, 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 the walls, they are finished. So in a way, uh, uh, the whole system of decisions uh, was a consequence of the original idea that was coming from this uh, analogy. Once the building is finished, uh, the building almost disappears in the landscape, or it even relates to the agricultural landscape of Andalusia. Uh, maybe some of you know all these, uh, you know, very large white walls that you find in the, in, in the landscape itself. You go down because the building is below ground as, as an archaeological excavation. You use one single material taken to the extreme, like it was, for example, in the San Telmo Museum San Sebastian, which is also only concrete in, in the slabs, in the walls, in the facades. <clears throat> the patios uh, is a system that, that really originates the plan. It's, it's not the spaces. The patios itself uh, organize sometimes wider patios, narrow ones, narrow ones, etc. In this case, for example, the perceptive qualities of architecture are very important. It's about the sound of water, the smell of the trees, the protection to the sun. Some of the specific uh, spaces, like the museum area, is even seven meters below ground, the one you see here, with a single material of the uh, construction that expresses the form itself. There is only one point when you go up, uh, and then you see the ruins that you are going to visit afterwards. We did also the interior, but also doing the interior, uh, the only other material that you will see the reason why we use, which is a red curtain, uh, is uh, the one that builds all these elements in relation to the architecture of the museum itself. More important for us probably is to show this uh, couple of images, because of course we are talking about 
an abstraction, a contemporary language, the, a, a contemporary material, the white concrete, nevertheless, in our opinion, that establishes this sort of conversation, if, if I can say that, with the ruins of the old city that is not anymore there, that, but that we can imagine only by, by looking at it. The city was called also originally, as far as I was told in Arab, the shiny city, the brilliant city, the white city. <clears throat> so that was also the reason of the white concrete. But it was also uh, uh, with red stucco. So the red became the Corten steel, the Corten steel became the roof, the roof became this sort of almost land art intervention <clears throat> in the landscape of Cordoba. That was a, 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 a way of uh, expressing also an idea that uh, started with an image but the image uh, organizes the whole way of thinking. Let's see another project that we, where we're working now. This is, you recognize many of you, Marrakesh. And of course, when we were, we were called, this is the only thing, that, the only project here today that is not a competition. The, after winning the Aga Khan Prize, um, a person, a rich person from Marrakesh who owns a collection of contemporary African art, they called us to, to design his foundation and museum. So for us, Marrakesh was this, no? It was a roof. If you look at the city, uh, it is uh, uh, the place where you see, but uh, unfortunately, his place for the museum was not there. It was in the outskirts, in these areas of the <clears throat> Palmeral, etc. But nevertheless, like in every project we work in any country, even if it's far away from ours, and this is not far away, but it's in a different culture, uh, we were trying to relate it to what we understand of this place. So the roofs clearly was uh, The roofs are very important in our ar architecture. It is forgotten. Modern architecture forgot about the roofs. Uh, with, uh, I mean, the flat roof basically was uh, considered the only solution. This is a flat roof, but it's about voids. So it's about geometry of the roofs, these sort of fractal geometries. It's the perfect geometry of the palmeras. It's the very attractive for us geometry of the ornamental elements of the world. It's about the space in between, is the mass, the protection from the sun. Marrakesh was also about <coughs> this uh, architecture of North Africa that is related to the historical Arab architecture in Spain, in which all of the buildings are somehow complete in themselves. And if the buildings become larger, they are uh, generated by addition. It's an additive architecture. This additive architecture is clearly expressed in the roof. So uh, that also organizes the way we work. We work always with, with models, uh, not only with computers, but uh, and especially with models, I have to say. At the time I was, we were studying here, everything was about models. I, I don't know now exactly, because things changed. But the models were so important here, and we started to do models of the roof on how the light is coming from above in this specific area of the museum. This is contemporary African art, but it's also a foundation with a lot of different uh, spaces. So this sequence that you see here, which is a selection that we put together, of course represents the many uh, variations that we were trying to do. Some of them more intuitive, some others step by step more connected to the real way of how the light had to come in or, or out, etc., illuminate. So uh, working with the hands, like the roofs of the city, was the analogy, say the Deng built, if we want to still use that word, or, or at least the way we interpret this, uh, uh, this term of uh, organizing the space. What you see in a triangle is simply because the plot we were doing had this form of a triangle. And then uh, the different areas of the foundation and museum were uh, added with this additive system, which uh, on the other hand was clearly related to the way uh, Arab architecture, or more than that, Islamic architecture, has been developing in history. Of course, for us, close places like Alhambra and Granada, but we, we visited also with our students years ago the Fatih Fati Kursika in India, again, an additive uh, uh, architecture of sort of Finnish buildings, all the palaces in Bahia and Marrakesh, <coughs> etc. The building is simply going, in, is in, without going into detail, uh, the main building, which is the entrance, the auditorium, the cafeteria, the shop, etc., the entrance uh, to the museum, the museum itself, an exterior cafe, and then the interstitial spaces. No? The, the spaces uh, are surrounded by a garden, <coughs> by all the services of a museum. We developed this project till the, say, schematic design level, and now for more than one year the project is uh, stopped. 
let's see if we have luck and the project final is, is built, I hope so, because it, it, it was also interesting for us in relation, like all of our projects, to the material, the structure, the material, and the space connected uh, through a, a memory of, or, of our, or our experience of a place. Of course, working in Northern Africa, Ram Earth became a theme that we started to the, to the point we could uh, to develop in order to try to find out this connection with this beautiful, impressive uh, architecture of the Southern Atlas in, in Morocco, uh, in a way uh, to inform a very contemporary building that is going to be made of white concrete, actually, with these walls of Ram Earth in a bigger dimension, therefore with a different uh, condition uh, that uh, Paradoxically, we had to start to develop with uh, German and Austrian specialists, not with people, not with the one in Morocco that didn't like to, uh, actually the owner had to be convinced. Uh, the interior space is very interesting because it's about the open space as well. So the interior patios become uh, another room of the place. Let's go another image that suddenly becomes um, shocking, no? because it's not about, uh, it's very, Precise, it's an object. Can an object uh, or the way an object is produced inform the project? This happened to us in the, I have to say, the very last project we won because we won it this week. And this is for us. Uh, so you're seeing it for the first time, we're showing it for the first time because it was uh, a limited competition, about five architects for, uh, uh, for a specific visitor center for a very well known company. Uh, that uh, is Mont Blanc, the one that uh, does, you may see, uh, you know, the precious fountain pens and so on. Uh, many of us, at least, we thought that Mont Blanc was Swiss or, or, or French, but we found out that it was German. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we got invited and they invited five architects, none of them German, unless they considered us German, I don't know. Uh, and it, it is in this impressive city, one of the most interesting in, in Germany for many reasons, you see the port, etc. But we were in the uh, w uh, west, uh, upper western side that you see there, in the industrial area where this company has the factory. Okay. So uh, it was uh, an ex it was not really an extension. It was a, a building for, like many companies do nowadays of this type, uh, for the uh, presentation of the product, exhibition of the artwork, presentation of the brand, etc., uh, etc., et auditorium, cafe, this sort of building. Uh, and it had to do again for us a difficult thing: how to interpret what is this company, and, and how to interpret an architectural project that is specifically placed in an industry in Hamburg. So there's the two different elements. One is, say, objective, which is the factory, Hamburg, the place, the site. The other one is more subjective, but the, but the, but the company was very interested, which is what is the identity of the company and how do you represent it in a building. So of course the identity started with this massive of bank, which is what gave name to the company, but also with the beautiful uh, objects that uh, since 100 years ago they developed, uh, and many of them you, you know, they are not only any more pens, there are many other sort of luxury objects, etc. But of course the pen, the fountain pen, is the origin of the whole thing. Uh, the other part, as I said, it was uh, the, the building itself, the, the, the industry, and what to do there. Actually, they gave us, uh, as a site, this is the, the main factory, they gave us this area in order to, 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 to do a, spe a special building, this is what they said, uh, and also solve part of the parking in front. Our, res our proposal it was very straightforward. We thought it was a very good opportunity not only to do a nice building, whatever it was, but rather to transform the image of the factory itself. So our proposal was to do a very long building. This very long building and, and also in, uh, extends into a landscape uh, it was going to be a sort of a case building. It was uh, going to close the image of the, of the factory uh, in the exterior, and it was going to try to play, and this was our approach that apparently was successful, with an idea that was interesting for us, how these objects come in a case. So in the beginning, you don't see what's inside. Then the object itself is beautifully designed, and it's, uh, but it's conceived, again, as an object. 
But then inside there is a whole world of details, a, a world of sophistication, of handwork, of, of materials uh, that we learned when we went to the factory. So that was the leading idea. Uh, and what we were proposing is a very simple exterior building of 110 meters with a section that uh, starts to relate these three levels of the building. So that, in a way, uh, this sort of case was going to include this sequence of sometimes compressed, sometimes expanded spaces that had a sort of a core center with a sort of hanging dome of wood that brings the light uh, from the sides and somehow connects all the rather organized system of uh, levels where the most important ones were, was, were they dedicated to the art collection that they have, to the brand exhibition of their products, or to these elements of shop, cafe, auditorium that they have on the ground floor. The other important part uh, is how do you transmit the image to the exterior? How can be a building a case? And the building became also this sort of case with, a, in this case, a, 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 a plastic resigned facade which relates also to the, to the material they use in the company that could be used also for projections eventually. This is something we have to develop from now on. It's not, not developed yet. It's simply suggested, as you see here. But more than that, that reflects something that it was at the beginning a little bit difficult for us. No? Can a, an object simply inform the building? And this case, that was the model we presented, includes the whole interior inside. And we want to another thought image. Yeah? The same as Simon Blanc. Now we are going to work with a hidden space. This is, uh, this is a sculpture of a very well-known artist in Spain about Chiquida. And this artist is an artist that is working with the void. So the space, he is looking for the space inside the stone. Uh, and uh, well, this is a special building because the building that you're seeing is a five-star hotel. I know it doesn't look like it because it looks more like a fishmonger place or something like that. The building is not very beautiful, but uh, the owners know it. And because they know it, they organized a competition uh, to demolish the building and to build a new one. And uh, of course, uh, the building was not always as it is now. It was originally the building was like that, and it was always a hotel. But, uh, and uh, with a very special condition, because it's exactly in the axis of the walking street of the center of Munich. And it's always framed by the gate to the old city of Munich. Even in a, this very sad photograph of our, after the war, you can still see the gate and you can still the, see the building very nearly demolished on the other side of the gate. So now we are in the city of Munich. The center of the city of Munich is really near, is nearly a circle. Um, here is the center, the circle that is surrounded by, uh, by a wall and at the same time it has this gate. This gate that it's right in front of that spot where, is the, where the uh, Koningshof uh, Hotel is right now. As you see, it is completely in front of the access of the city, which is a uh, walking street. Um, so when uh, we entered the competition, we tried to understand exactly the situation of the building as it was. So we found out that originally in that spot where the building is built now, there always existed an um, isolated, another isolated building. In the situation that it is now, as you see, is confronted with the gate of the city, and it always has been like that. So for us, it was very important to understand this. This is the situation that was given there before the war, but after the war, and when we went to see it, for us it was kind of a shock because we understood the Im urban importance that this building had within the city of Munich. This, this building, even though the quality of architecture is more than doubtful, it was really in the edge, in, it, in, the, in the frame of the door, even when you were walking towards it, the gate of the city of Munich still framed the building 
and even outside of the gate, it still was in the center of the plaza, like the president of all the space there. So, for us it was important to understand this and to understand the importance of the frontality of the building. So we decided to work with the void, the void that was going to be in the access of the walking street. So what we were trying to do is to get the uh, public space inside the building. So we were going to introduce the public space in the void of the building. And it's really the void, with the one which, with which we are working. It's the void, the one that is generating the space, and the building is simply around it. So this is what I'm talking about, about this blank space uh, uh, this that, as you see, the void inside the building is relating all of the spaces. It's a continuation of the public space outside. Here we see the model in relation to, uh, to this other piece of Chigida. Uh, Chigida, as you see, the artist that is always working in the inside of the stone, and the space really is not the stone itself, but is the void. The same thing that we are trying to do here by working with the void inside the building. Something working with the void that we have done from really the beginning of uh, the first times that we built, like in this building in Extremadura, in Merida, where the two big volumes were connecting through this void with the city of Merida at the other side of the river. Or this recent, more recent building in Madrid, which is a market, that is principal or more important space is this public street that crosses the two volumes of the building. Coming back to Munich, we go back to the place where we started and we can see this frontality of the new building at the end framed by the door. So once that we are looking towards it, we are really not walking towards the void. The public space is uh, continuous inside the building and is the continuation of the public space outside that we take inside. And it's this inside that is this important space for us. It's this void that is linking the new building to the, uh, to the city of Munich. Well, we are, um, we are going to go out to tender with this building now, so we hope to start building quite soon. And uh, this is another artist, another Spanish artist, it's Palazuelo, and he is uh, cutting and, and, and folding this, <laughs> cutting and folding this piece of steel, which is something that for us triggered our imagination in this other situation. Because once that we had worked in this building, and everybody says it's an ugly building, I don't know if by that reason, we were invited to another competition in the city of Bristol. And it was a competition to build a new facade for this building, which is called an ugly building, and I don't say it is the newspapers of, of uh, England, that says it's the ugliest building of uh, England. Well, the building is not such a bad building as in the other one but really it has been very badly treated. It was like um, they have a very, it's very badly kept, and not only that, it's, it has all these awful additions that are not really respecting the building at all. Anyway, we are now in the city of Bristol, and in a place like this, it's the Royal Infirmary. The city of Bristol is called Bridge. It came from the name Bridge Town because it was uh, uh, originally had this bridge with these very beautiful facades. So this, the city has a connection to facades because it's also supposedly the place where this artist Bansky is born. You know Bansky, the artist that creates new facades in any place that he can paint them. So this. Uh, we understood that there is a space, a sort of strange connection with the city and the facades. But when we were invited to the competition, we really doubt to enter it, to, to go for it, because for two reasons. First of all, because we didn't really understand architecture when it's completely, when we are only acting on one part of it. So it's only acting on a facade. And at the same time, because it was not, the building was not really attractive. But maybe because of that, it really became like a challenge. 
So we decided to uh, try. So this is the original building of the infirmary hospital. This is not the building that we are going that was extended with this building in the one that we are working in the 60s. As you see, the building is not a bad building originally. It's strong. So we thought that we had to keep, in a way, uh, part of this building, part of the facade of this building. The problem was all these other things that uh, the building had, and most this green thing there, it's a, it's a um, welcome center, and of course it was built only a couple of years ago, so we simply couldn't take it away. We had to deal with it. So the, the only thing that we could do is include it, in, include it in the facade. So what we did was a very simple thing. We uh, just put a veil on top of the, uh, of, the, of the facade, we cut it and we fold it, and we simply put it on top of the building, creating a series of new volumes. So we were not only working with the facade, but we are, now we're working also three-dimensionally. Uh, this is the way that we were working, and of course, the, the, well, not of course, but we worked also, the distribution of the facade was linked to the original building. I mean, the rhythm of the facade was linked to the rhythm of the original building. Here you see the folding in which we include the, uh, se the visitor center, and on the other side, with the other folding, we connect to the a street at the, to the other to the to the other building at the same level in the street, and we create a new small public area for the city, which is well done here because the street here, when if uh, you ever go to uh, to Bristol, the street is like a very quick street. It's only cars, noise, and it's having really a little corner of, of a public space where you can relax. Is a nice thing to have there. Uh, we built models, of course, of the facade in which you can see the three-dimensional uh, way of working, and we had all sorts of problems because the building had asbestos and we had a lot of technical things to take care of, but the most difficult one was that we had to work with the building in use. And of course, it was a hospital, so it was not easy. Anyway, we try to do it all at the same time. So this was the image of the building in 1960s. This was the image of the building a couple of years ago. And this is the image of the building a couple of months ago. So you see the folding of the facade that re re recovers or, or integrates in the in, within the facade, the uh, center, and on the other side, connecting to the already existing building of the infirmary, we create the new public space. When looking to the front of the building, you see that we have worked exactly with the same divisions that the old building has. It's in a way, when we look to it, it kind of reminds us of a musical sequence. <coughs> And I don't know, here, seeing it from the front, you can see the three-dimensional, uh, when the, build, when the uh, facade unfolds and creates this three-dimensional setting of the building that is more noticeable uh, when the sun is shining and it creates those shadows over the back facade. When the building hits the ground and it goes in front of the uh, um, Welcome Center, we are also careful to respect the building behind so that we leave all the um, windows and we are not taking out either light or uh, a structure of the, that existing building. On the other side, we create a new space that separates us from this street and gives a small relaxing space for the entrance of the hospital. The next project uh, goes back to the light motif of the whole the presentation. Again, the mirror. The, this is again um, uh, 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 Duchamp playing chess with himself, repeating uh, the image of himself. It became the beginning of another project that was uh, quite interesting for us because it was a secondary project, apparently, one of the few that we did in Madrid. At the time, we were building in the center of Madrid this 
rather large uh, um, marketplace with a sports center that you saw an image before. We had to build a temporary market. To build a temporary market it was a secondary project. Uh, the city simply needed something for two years. Uh, at the end, it was four years. But it became a, a way of uh, experimenting in a way that uh, that has become this project has become the origin of many others in a way, or in parallel to many others. So actually, what we decided to do is a series of elements that are so simple as one pentagonal form, which is repeated three times, rotated, and then another pentagonal form, this, uh, which is the same three times. When you put them together, at the end, they become uh, an ensemble in which everything is the same, but everything is different. You know? And it's extremely um, econ uh, economical, conceptually speaking, not only in terms of, of money, which also, in the sense that we only develop one element, and this element can be uh, com combined in many different ways. It's again about combination, permutations, variations, combinatorial thinking. Uh, maybe because we are very lazy, at the end we like to design only one thing, and one thing we can combine it and, and, and achieve complexity. The project lasted only uh, what it lasted, uh, this uh, three years, uh, a little bit more. Yeah? Uh, actually, uh, during the time it became a, so, a sort of also an, an art installation in the city, if I can say it like that, yeah? because during the night it was uh, illuminated uh, uh, altogether, and it became this sort of lantern, uh, unexpected in a temporary market that had to be developed. Uh, it made us use materials that we were, till then, not interested in, and from now on more, uh, for example, polycarbonate and very simple materials that uh, didn't have to last so much. But the uh, destiny was to be demolished, and the building was demolished a couple of months ago, as you see there. But nevertheless, it became also the origin of other projects. No? We are doing now a competition we won in, in, at the same time in Munich uh, for, in this case, office buildings, for a, as an exception in our career. It was a competition organized by the city, and these buildings that are now under construction in which we don't do the interiors, but we do the, all, the whole uh, concept of the, of, the, of the master plan, at the end play with the same idea. If you develop one single element, uh, you rotate it, the roof becomes uh, special, then suddenly a space and a new public space comes. But uh, these buildings are, are all related to this uh, contemporary art center in Cordoba. Uh, it goes back to the idea I said before. After working many years in Cordoba for the archaeological museum, we got invited to this competition that was important at the time, in these times in which in Spain there were competitions, because I have to say that now it's quite difficult, the situation a little bit improving, but not so much. But at that time, that was a very interesting competition for the Contemporary Center for Visual Arts, Video Art, Digital Art, in front of the Mosque of Cordoba, over there that you see, near a building that at the time was very well known from Renkul Has over May, uh, that finally is not going to build. So at the end, uh, the building uh, appears near the river, but in front of the mosque. The mosque represents all these ideas that I, uh, we have been insisting very much, variation, combination, repetition, one double arch creates this amazing space of the Cordoba uh, 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 Mosque, but also what is sometimes rejected as purely ornamental became for us a way of thinking is this ornament in another scale can become a spatial uh, entity, and this was the whole origin of the project that we have shown several times. I, I don't want to extend it very much, but it's very much about scaling this element and making it a structural, in this case, concrete structures of a very large scale. Put it in other words, can we inhabit it, uh, a, a Mukarna? Can we make it a building and see what qualities it has? That was the origin of the whole thing. It was very interesting because all these geometries that you see there, of course, relate to very much uh, everything in the world, algorithm that is so much uh, in, in our language or in our days, which is an Arab world, uh, is very much related to geometry, to mathematics, to a series of elements that nowadays are constantly in use. Actually, when I show this, is because we received several uh, letters and emails, uh, even though even recently, still last year, you know, from a mathematician in, in France who was developing his PhD on the Voronoi, uh, tessellation. Uh, another professor of mathematics in Spain that was extremely interested to find out which was the, 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 the origin, the mathematical origin of our project. Uh, that uh, she related, of course, to René Descartes and the, and the, and the idea of filling the, the whole 
the surface, etc. Maybe we disappointed them for sure because we said that we were working like this. So we were working <laughs> simply, simply with the hands, uh, and it's the way. Maybe it's because we are the old school still there. Uh, the rest of the office is not, but uh, we, we were working like this. And only by knowing that and checking it with the hands, we started to find out the geometries that were behind. And of course, the geometries uh, relate to our uh, uh, regular hexagon that is divided in three spaces of 150, 90, and 60 square meters, but they are inside a regular uh, hexagon. And then we play with symmetries, rotations, etc and find out a, a system that looks random, but of course it's not random. No? At the end there are spaces that are um, all of them uh, concatenated, integrated, and create the sequence of, um, uh, say, exhibition spaces of this uh, video and visual art center, whereas the rest of the building relates to the studios and to the common areas that you see in plan. In section probably you understand this idea of inhabitant Amukarna or Amasharamiya which is a section of the, in yellow or in, or in orange. Yeah? It's sort of an inverted element, all made of concrete. The whole interior is this dark concrete because it's about uh, the connection of uh, every little hole that you see there is a possible connection for um, um, digital elements, for Mars, for mechanical elements. The, mod the models we were working had always in mind this idea behind. This is what we meant with this images that are thoughts, yeah? uh, that, that, that we somehow didn't uh, go away from that. And this idea of working with the hands and of course with the computers and with the models and the construction went even uh, to the detail of a media facade or a, say a, an art facade that we developed with a German group, uh, Realities United from Berlin, <coughs> which is what you see there. The building was built very quickly, but then the crisis came. Uh, uh, what you see is the building finished with no use. Now we finished finally the exterior. So now uh, we, I don't have photos here, but the exterior landscape is already done. So we are only waiting that uh, somebody uh, uh, can approve that it can be used by artists freely. We, they don't need to, to have a, a big museum. It's not actually a museum, it's simply a, a space, a concert house. No? Uh, so I hope it, was, it will come soon. Yeah. The outside is completely white. It's prefabricated systems that we have used in several occasions. Again, combinatorial elements of panels, but the inside is, like in many of our buildings, pure concrete. And this is, everything is out of concrete. The whole structure is also the form of the building. The light is coming from above because it has to be controlled in only a few points. And whenever this building is finally used, I'm sure the artist will transform it and, and, and close it and modify it because at the end it's a container that we thought the artist should react to, whether liking it or whether hating it. But uh, in, in any case, uh, it's a sort of uh, point against this idea that a Kunst house has to be a neutral space. Uh, and, and this is a different story. It has to be, in this case, it's not a neutral space. It's something that relates in our own interpretation to the very memory of the uh, place where it is, which is in Cordoba, and, and it relates to, to the history of the place. Yeah? The light that you see here comes only from the roof in special occasion. The roof, again, uh, this roof that was forgotten by modern architecture and for us is in many of our ways, not to say in all of them at a point, is the one that defines uh, the structure, defines the section, defi defines the natural light. This is the office, again, you know what we do with our office. <laughs> so if, if somebody comes to the office, you know you will come to a roof one day and somehow dangerously. Um, and then the facade that we developed with uh, Realities of the United is important because it's not a video, it's not a video for that, it's an art installation itself. And it came from this idea of, uh, of using the, the same pattern uh, that we were using in the building. So at the end, uh, this idea of the geometrical pattern can go to all the different scales of the building and goes actually from the structure of the space to the to this system of bowls. Each of these bowls, which is uh, done in GRC, glass reinforced concrete, has an LED lamp. And there are, uh, say, 1,500 LED lamps, or say, 1,500 bowls. But these bowls play a, 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 a shape themselves, yeah? so that um, in the distance, when you're close to it, you don't realize anything. 
you have to be on the other side of the river, Guadalquivir, and this other side uh, of the river, uh, of the river, uh, which has beautiful uh, landscape designed by a great architect and friend, which is Navarro Valdebeck. Then from there on, the building has another, another view. For us, important also because the the building you see behind, what you saw, the one which is yellow over there, is the mosque. So the Mezquita de Córdoba, which informed the geometry of this project, is also present in the building itself. The building therefore has a view during the day or a view during the night and forms part of this uh, idea uh, that generated the whole thing. Let's go to the last few projects because in this case sometimes this end builder that we like to say or these images that are thoughts come directly from architecture. And here this is something that we learned where you are sitting here because uh, at the time we were taking uh, courses in, in, I remember a course in Russian avant-garde, Russian constructivism, that especially in just us very much. Yeah? So uh, when we uh, got invited uh, to, this, to participate in the competition for the Contemporary Art Center in Russia, in Moscow, we, we didn't know the place, uh, but we knew what we learned about this Russian constructivism. So if you know Moscow, that now we know better because we have been several times, this is a center, this is the area of the of the Kremlin, etc., with the same dimension over there, there is this new neighborhood, an old airport in the center of the city that has been transformed in this, this sort of new neighborhood with offices, expensive apartments, etc., etc., and there is a place that uh, the government decided the new contemporary center should be placed. But more important for them probably that the contemporary center was the, the, the commercial center because this is the commercial center that it was under construction, 500 meters long. And in front, uh, there was the uh, place for the contemporary art center. Uh, so comparable, it was a small place. For us, nevertheless, it opened another theme that uh, we see in the last project, which is the scale. Because uh, the buildings you have seen are no more than eight or 10,000 square meters, and this was supposed to be 60,000 square meters of museum. So for us, Melnikov and the Russian avant-garde became the theme, the, the things that we knew, the things that we were interested in. This is a, a, a defense um, a project, a museum, uh, sorry, a defense ministry from Melnikov, never built. Of course, we went to see the house of Melnikov that we always admire so much because it plays with this idea, again, of combination of two elements this intersection, but also the fantasies of Chernikov and the Russian avant-garde, the utopias never built and so linked also to the industrial images, and even more, the, 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 uh, the, the very uh, orthodox churches with the volumes and cylinders that go up. So the project started with this beautiful model from Melnikov himself. This is a model of his house, the intersection of the two pieces. Yeah? And we started to play again. Uh, as you see, we, we show many models and many playful architecture because it's like we understand how to play with a very large scale, a very uh, relatively undefined program, uh, which at the end was organized in this bar with a sequence of silos-like buildings that at the end uh, uh, adapt to the situation or are cut in different places and create uh, this uh, very large building that uh, has to do, of course, <clears throat> or is very much connected to the Cordoba Museum that we did before. In this case, these silos are the exhibition spaces that connect one to the other, and the very long uh, sort of uh, uh, interior street uh, connects all the spaces. Yeah? The building has very different scales, uh, and at the end appears, or would appear like that, in the, in the center of this very large uh, area of Moscow. Actually, uh, <clears throat> there was a final shortlist. We were among the three. Um, apparently, one of the very possible winners, but at the end, the board of directors chose another one, so we are not going to build it. But for us, it became a quite interesting theme in the way of understanding that sometimes the projects are originated by our own background, our own personal interest, our own memory. In this case, of a course that we took at the beginning here in Columbia University. But in this case, it was also a way of dealing with very large scale. So, this project that you see now is in China. Uh, working in China, and many of you know, and many of you maybe are Chinese here, is working in a, in a scale that we are not used at all, definitely not in Spain, not in Central Europe. 
Uh, and here we were in Guangzhou, and in Guangzhou, you know, is Guangzhou, Shenzhen, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Pearl River Delta, altogether 50 million people, when Spain alone is only 45. So something uh, made us uh, um, change completely the scale. Uh, the competition was for this museum in this area where they are building three museums very close to this axis where this is the opera that Saha Hadid did. Uh, which is in a parallel of the historical axis of the city. The city was known for us as Canton, uh, like in Europe for, for centuries. Huh? And we uh, show many, many times these images of the old <coughs> uh, drawings and plans, because even if, if it's a uh, utopical, I mean, uh, uh, utopical image, the city for sure was never like that, but it shows again the axis, it shows the repetition of the housing it shows this uh, connection that uh, the Chinese culture has with this very long axis where they place usually these uh, more important places, but also about this repetition of one single element. For example, in the city of uh, Wanzhou, there are still neighborhoods like this, many of them disappearing, as you know, that were so attractive for us because the house is again a combinatorial idea. The house is again variation of, like a musical variation of one single thing, and it's, it's separated by these interstitial spaces. So, we were interested in working also with a material that we had not used very much, which is a ceramic, simply because we thought ceramic is linked to the Chinese tradition. And this uh, ceramical vase became a sort of a, an idea for a, a, for a very large building, so, which is the, last, uh, the one you see on the right, which is a container. And so if we put together these nine containers, uh, we achieve a system that is no more than what we, are, we have been showing during the whole lecture. So to design one thing, uh, type two, three, to make combinations, and at the end, if you look carefully to, uh, if it works, to what we have here, uh, at the end, uh, what we are doing is a very simple thing, which is like a game, that everything in plan is the same. It's only the roofs that suddenly change, and the roofs are the ones that create a different perception of the building, which as you can imagine is something that relates to the other projects we have been showing and working, because uh, they express very well that the roof and the geometry are the instruments that are, or the tools that are enough to create this complexity that in plan is extremely simple. No? So the plan is a very simple set of containers. Our own interest is, is in the volume and the space in between. Uh, the, the space in between becomes another very large scale element. Because if you see this model, what we're doing is really a bridge. Actually, uh, it's uh, a public space below that we want to introduce the public space into the lobby of the hotel, uh, of the museum. So what you see over there, uh, this uh, sketch of the structure explains that we're doing three very large bridges of 45 meters span. Uh, that will allow this very special interior spaces, whereas the plan is almost uh, almost stupid. Huh? It's almost a series of boxes, containers, because the whole idea is the space in between and the roofs of, of the space. We are developing now the project is very advanced <coughs> uh, in the office now in Berlin, and hopefully it will start construction very soon. And I will finish now. This is the last project of this very long series that we wanted to give you this more, of, as I said at the beginning, biographical idea to understand that the way we work in many different places. And we are going back to the beginning, to the spiegel in spiegel, to the mirror in the mirror. Because uh, we are now developing and uh, about to start construction this project for uh, Arbo Part, this great composer <coughs> that I'm sure many of, of you know. Uh, again, in, in a quite different country, it's different for us, uh, the, the very north of Europe, in Estonia, <coughs> in this uh, beautiful landscape near the sea, that uh, I have, uh, in most of the cases, uh, the place we have done, we, we have visited the place. In this case, we had not, when we did the competition, so the whole reference for us was Finland, because Finland is a place we have visited many times for many reasons, and we are very connected to Finland in a way. Yeah? And this is uh, strangely, I didn't know at the time, now I know, we know very well. It's a country that speaks well, almost the same language as Finnish. Uh, it's only one hour away in the ferry from, from Helsinki. It, it, it only had a very different recent history, yeah? as you know, with the Soviet Union, etc. In this place uh, that uh, Arbo Park was living as a young man, uh, now he's being Arbo Park, the national figure of Estonia, in a way. He's now 80 years old. 
um, there I want to build the foundation, uh, the archives, uh, the exhibition center, a small auditorium uh, of the Arbo Park Foundation. Yeah? And today's chosen place is the one you see here. Actually, when we entered the competition, and it was uh, a competition that was uh, very, uh, very nicely announced. No? It was with the, with the sound of Spiegel in Spiegel, in this place that you see here, in a video that showed you where we had to work, which is over there. Actually, Arbo Park uh, is this musician that uh, in some cases has been defined as minimalist, but this is a very restrictive uh, uh, name for sure. It's an extremely spiritual uh, music that you know for sure that plays with this very combinatorial idea. You would say that music is always combinatorial, but in this case more than ever. No? This was the brief of the competition, almost only this spiral with the different spaces that had to be inside. So when we started to work, we tried to reflect this idea of the void in relation to the silent in the music. At the end, it's a personal interpretation, but the void became again this figure that we work in this pentagon-shaped uh, figure and became a sequence of patios. The patios allowed the trees to come from the inside, so to, to avoid, to, de to destroy uh, most of the trees. The building is in the middle of this impressive uh, uh, forest of, of trees. This is a model of the competition where we had still more patios than we have nowadays in the final project. Uh, the final project is the one you see here. Uh, which plays with this sequence of patios and a very long sort of snake wall, like the music of Arbo Park and Sin Sound in a way. Everything that surrounds the building is this archive offices of this foundation. In the center are all the public areas that you see. When you see the sections, you realize that the roof again became, became a theme, like in all of our projects. The, the, the roof is folded and interrupted by these uh, perforations that are the patios. No? So the different models we, we have been working <clears throat> and we have been doing in this project that has been done in the office in Madrid. And in this case, uh, the roof itself uh, somehow transmits this idea of everything below a roof. The rendering still belongs to the competition. So you see more holes, but the whole idea uh, was from the very beginning there, a building that almost should disappear in the landscape. Working with Arbo Park himself, as you see in this image, uh, makes also a very special uh, way of acting. Yeah? It's, a, it's a moment where we draw the, the plan in the floor, and with him, which is an extremely polite and, and a great person, he, was, he didn't want to tell us that he didn't like exactly the position of the building. But finally, we understood that there was a, a place he didn't like completely because he saw something in the distance. So we started to move it, and we changed it, something that we are not used anymore, it's, which is unfortunately. Finally, the, the building found So, there are many words that you say um, over and over again, and some that you, you do not mention. Um, so I've been making a list of some of the words you uh, seem to be obsessed with. Uh, geometry, history, geometry, history, memory, 
light, material, combination, structure, ruins, mirror, void, interstitial, landscape, abstraction, concrete, corten, roof, space. Here are some you did not mention. Program, use, type, technology, environment. It's not that we imagine you don't think about these things, but I'm curious to uh, know about this kind of the other sort of side of architecture that um, either doesn't interest you or it hasn't entered the discourse. Well, it's not that it hasn't interested us, uh, interest us, but for example, the, you mentioned the program. It's not that we are not interested in program. We know that we have to comply with the program, but we think that the program is not so really so important because at the end the uh, building buildings change. I mean, it's uh, th there is something in architecture that uh, we are used to a building that once in a th upon a time had is being built for a special thing, and at the end of his life is is changing and this, and this uh, being able to, to um, comply with another program. So yes, we have to comply. I'm not trying to say that we do not have to think in program. No, that's not true. Mm -hmm. We have to comply with program. We have to comply with what we are being asked for. Mm -hmm. But that's something that you have to do. But uh, when you are doing architecture, it's something more than what you simply have to comply with. That's why maybe in the case of program, it sounds like Louis Kahn a little bit. I, I don't know. I think Fonsanda said it very, very clearly. I think there are many things in architecture that, that you have to do, I would say, simply professionally or, or socially. You, you have to do it. You have to build well. You have to uh, technically solve the problems. Mm -hmm. Even uh, now, a word that is very commonly used, and they say always, like uh, everything that has to do with susten sustainability. Uh, and we take it now for granted. We need to do that. It's not that uh, mm -hmm. the project is, uh, has to be explained only in that line. It can be, but we need to do that. We need to um, comply with the program because if not, all these projects we showed would have never been built because we have clients, of even course. though we didn't show them here. <laughs> and the clients talk about program, economy, uh, sustainability, mm -hmm. and we talk also about that with them. But we want to transmit here, especially in school, uh, is that this is not that moves us so much. Mm -hmm. uh, what moves us is our own inner world and the way one project leads to another because it, it, it's a, a way of interpreting a specific situation. I, I want to ask you a little bit about um, the process of invention. And um, I read your book, Memory and Invention. And I've been thinking a little bit about what you said about um, how, in a way, you can't um, necessarily invent anything new because you're drawing from images or dank villa, or, you know, or things that you experienced in the past. And in a way, one could say this is the kind of context that you were working within. And I've been trying to count the kind of possible context that, um, that we could consider you to be working within. Um, I can think of five, and I want to ask you a little bit about uh, authorship and imagination and process in relation to, you know, to these contexts. So one, I would say, is your work, uh, you have spoken about Utzon, uh, Alto, um, actually Khan as well. And so your work, I guess, is it, in constant dialogue with the discipline. Um, until the last project in Estonia, I would have said more through the section, but it seems that, you know, in the, in the plan. So that's kind of, one could say, one context. The other one is the cult sort of cultural context that you um, uh, extract from, from different, uh, you know, places, whether it's Chiyida's sculpture or Leonel Feininger's painting or Melikov or the ones that you didn't speak about, which uh, from an American context, we could say um, Richard Serra, Robert Irwin, Mary Miss, Alice Aycock, sort of the, the, the land art. Um, perhaps the third one is the context of an office's work in Madrid, um, you know, after Moneo or in parallel with Moneo. I guess there would be your office, Mancia Tunión, and uh, our own Avalos Nereros, or at least Juan Herreros, you know, clearly working in sort of different, different ways in Madrid, but also drawing from, you know, Coderch, uh, whether it's uh, de Oiza, uh, Soto, you know, different, uh, your lineage, I feel, is kind of interesting to sort of think about in that sense. Uh, the fourth one is the one that you spoke about the most, which is the local historical context of your work. It seems that most of your work until recently, at least, seems to be working within charged, incredible kind of context, you know, historical buildings that you tease uh, out or that you add roofs onto it and so on. 
And then, and then finally, maybe this is the least interesting one, but it's worth mentioning, you have two offices, um, Madrid and, and uh, Berlin. And I visited your office with some of our GSAP students last fall. You guys weren't there, but I met your, your great staff and so on. So within all these kinds of contexts, uh, you know, can we, you speak a bit about process in relationship to these frameworks or contexts, or shall we say sites, that you set up um, relative to existing buildings versus new buildings, because it seems to me that there's quite a difference in your approach um, between those two categories. With existing buildings, you have a kind of a dialogue, right? With, yeah. And with new buildings, you have to set up new, new frameworks. It's a long, charged question, but I'm interested to know about context in relationship to your work. I can, I can talk about the existing buildings. I think we learned a lot from the existing buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, with having the chance of working in in the historical substance, in historical buildings. This has a lot to do with our background because we, Spain is a place where this happens. I would say in Europe, generally speaking, but in Spain in the last 20 years. To an extent that we have discussed that several times with other colleagues, I think one of the most specific questions about Spanish architecture in the last 20 years, in these good years of Spanish architecture, has been this relation with historical buildings or existing buildings that are extended, transformed. Because there are countries like, for example, in, in Italy, where this is so limited because of the, of the, of the laws of protection that mm. it doesn't happen, and in some others where there was no, no matter attention to it. So in a way, I think we learned very much about that because you have re restrictions, you have limits. No? Uh, and when you have limits, you have to immediately try to find out the way. Mm -hmm. It's a famous problem of, of the blank paper. No? Mm. Even though I don't believe there is a blank paper because uh, your mind is always full, but, but the blank paper uh, is not the same when you have something. No? And something immediately triggers your mm -hmm. imagination. So probably that's the reason when there is a building there, there is a, a historical context, or even, a, even like the... Um, like this hospital in Bristol, I mean, it's full of complexities that you have to find the most simple solution. No? Whereas when you work in a new project, uh, then, that's a, then suddenly it's your own memory, your own experience, the one that uh, informs the project. No? Uh, if we go to uh, Moscow, to um, an empty place near a commercial center, it has to be our own background about Russia, uh, Russian uh, avant-garde, the one that helps us. Uh, and then we, 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 we feel free to do whatever we like, but uh, within this idea. I, I, I like this point because it, it was, I never thought completely but, uh, about it, but it's true that it, it creates this double situation, I think. Can you speak about authorship? Um, you, you wrote in the book that working in existing buildings, you were inherently working with another author, um, the, the, the original author. It's just kind of another dialogue that you you know, you're always happy. And so how does this, uh, you know, affect you, the way you think about your own authorship? Even the building. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's, uh, when we were writing about that, it's because also we, uh, it, it relates to what I was saying in the beginning, because architecture is the only art, I don't know if you can say, of the um, art that can be extended, and nobody is um, extended, modified, changed, and nobody really thinks about it. It's normal. It's something that you normally do. But if you go and you try to stand, I know, I don't know, maybe a picture of Goya, <laughs> or if you try to modify a picture of Goya, that's strange. <laughs> or would you would you try? I mean, it's it if you are reading or writing a novel or a book. And it's not normal that you extend the book or that you modify it. It's, it, it's run, it, it runs in this way. So when we are saying about the authorship, of course, you have to understand the building in which you are working. And uh, what we, we say is that we try to understand the mind, not the mind, we try to understand the history of the building and the mind of the person that created in the beginning, why the building is working in that specific way. And what do we have to do? Because the only thing that really we have to do to understand the building is, or to work with the building is to continue with its history. Mm -hmm. So in that way, it can be extended in a good way. I don't know if I'm explaining mm -hmm. correctly, but. And, and how is it uh, very different from you, for you when you're working on, on new buildings? It seems that in the absence of these frameworks, you, you impose them, whether it's through an, an enclosure or a bar or something that creates a kind of a context. Well, it's, uh, 
there is always something. Yeah? <laughs> if it's a bar, it's because there was something that made us think that it's a bar. Or if we make a void, it's because uh, there was, um, like in Munich, um, an axis that opened. So I, 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 I don't remember a project where there was nothing, uh, really, in our case. No? Moscow, it was more than nothing. No, but there was a lot. There was a history of the Russian government. Well, yes, or history, you... but in the place, there yeah. was... Mm. Yeah, so I think there's always something, but at the end, it, uh, we always deal with our objective world, which is what is there, what we frame and see, and then by framing it, we decide to what themes we address, and this is very personal, and our subjective world, the mirror of ourselves, in which then uh, it's our own world. We like to present our, uh, I know there's a lot of projects, but we used to show many projects, because I don't believe we, we know how to explain ourselves only with a couple of projects. Uh, uh, they make no sense in a way. I can show one project in detail, and that might be very interesting for some students to understand how it was developed, but it makes only sense when, when we see constantly our own work because they refer to one another and not in a linear way mm -hmm. and not in a chronological way. Changing uh, tack a little bit, I just want to think about um, abstraction, which is a, a theme I think that comes up in your work. You've, you've talked about it a little bit in the lecture, but also uh, one could interpret the work as a kind of a will towards abstraction versus type. Um, one question that comes out of that for me is, why are there no people in the photographs of your buildings? <laughs> or things, one could say that very, uh, many, you mostly um, high design museums, so, uh, you know, it, in, in your book, many of the photographs show empty rooms with concrete, sometimes with, you know, some objects, but always very few people, and some, mostly I think they're your staff. Yeah. Your office, your, your yes. employees. Especially you know. when we are in the roofs. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's our staff. I know that yes. nowadays, Almost all architecture is full of people uh, in, in the images. There is no image which is not full of people. To an extent, to some, in some occasions, the whole intervention project, whatever, is simply shown because it's full, yeah? which is fine. Eh? I don't have anything against that. But I, uh, but I uh, exactly, uh, we have thought about that recently, no? Mm -hmm. Because uh, we think that. Uh, this is showing a particular way of being used, the building at, at a certain point, and the really interesting thing is that buildings are constantly used differently, constantly, we should show movies. But does it also come from Chiida, or, or the fascination with the sculptural object mm. for you, this, this choice? Might be, but, but, but what I mean is that, the, let's put it the other way, uh, what the only, uh, we as architects, we do not control many things. Mm. On the other hand, uh, the architect is losing control more and more. Uh, uh, but we have control in our projects to a certain extent of the space, of the light, of the material. Mm -hmm. The rest is, is open to the people, to the way they sleep. I mean, uh, they, they will, uh, we show, for example, the Cordoba Art Center. The Cordoba Art Center is shown empty because it's not yet in use. But we are convinced this project will be changed completely. I mean, it will be full of things and we are not against that. It's simply something will happen. Uh, but it's not exactly we that uh, show how it happens. So we can show it with people or without people, but what we do is to defend some frames to leave it open. That's how we see it. I, I still wonder, though, that, um, if there's a kind of desire for abstraction that is driving um, some of those decisions. I mean, one could interpret your work as kind of, uh, you know, a challenge to the idea of type in the sense that you well, basically, you're always trying to design roofs, or, or, or one could say landscapes, turning an architecture project into a landscape, either by burying it, or creating a roof, or interpreting it as a kind of a landscape, um, or integrating with a landscape. Um, and, and for instance, uh, um, one could also say that there are, if there's an absence of legible elements like windows, or if there's a window, uh, like in San Telmo, is one window, and the rest is more a question of voids, you know, that there's a kind of desire to do not represent things, but rather effects or phenomena. Um, or Santermo, to bring that up again, is a kind of retaining wall. Again, a kind of a, an armature for, for a landscape. So I, I wonder if that's a correct reading, just to think that, that your facade, uh, that your, the project, your project, your bigger project is really about a kind of an abstraction or a kind of, not a reduction, but kind of a reframing of architecture as a kind of a, of a landscape very often. Not maybe in the later projects you showed. 
Yes, no, 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 I understand perfectly what you, what you say, because uh, in many cases, uh, we try to find out in each project which is the key that defines an idea. And we, we defend very much a, a project as an idea, or uh, uh, which is not uh, usually used anymore. When we were studying, everything was about which is the idea of this project. No? I have my problems now in Germany uh, with my students uh, in the school, but they, because they say concept. I say, well, concept is okay, but I want an idea, not only a concept. No? Well, and for, for our students, what is the difference? About what? Between idea and concept. Because the idea is, that's the reason I show it here, the idea is linked also, in my point of view, mm -hmm. always to a, a very a personal interior uh, interpretation. Whereas the concept can be relatively, in my point of view, mm -hmm. more general. No? So you, you, you wouldn't make diagrams very often. I mean, you show them for competitions, but rather than a diagram, for instance, you have a, a collection of images as a, as a department. We have. Can you pause again? No, no. I, I think you pause again. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I think that it falls again in the same in what we were discussing in the beginning about the, this thing about the program. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it's again for us a, diag a diagram. Yes, of course we do it. Mm -hmm. We have to do it because we, in that way, we understand better how we are working. Or when uh, I don't know when you were saying. Um, those are the things that come with that we have to do them. But the concept, mm -hmm. it's uh, the concept. It. The, we have to create a concept, and it has to be there. That doesn't mean that there is an idea uh, that really um, explains why the building is in, in which way and why it's mm -hmm. working in that way. I mean, the concept has to be there, because if not, there is no building at all. The diagrams, yes, it's a way of understanding better. But when you can explain what you are doing, then there is an idea for the building, which for mm -hmm. us is different than the concept. Yes. You were mentioning this idea if we have a set of images and say, well, this time it will be this project. No, no. no. no actually, the uh, images are many in our mind, in our computers, in our archives, and many that we took in our own traveling. We have been traveling our whole life and, and trying to see things in different ways. But we like much better, uh, and in some other in lectures, we use this image of the, of the, of the Atlas of Abi Barbo. We are more interested in the relation between images because that, that gives you the clue of how to understand. We don't believe that the projects are so simple as, as only one sketch, only one form, only. We believe that they are always open and it's only by establishing this relation that, that suddenly they can crystallize. So this, uh, it's a way of thinking that is a way of, of acting as an architect that developed through time of course, developing it through time, uh, we were interested in the work of Avi Barbour or the way Avi Barbour relates to, uh, to Valer Benjamin or etc. But, but it, because it explains that it is in between these relationships that the projects come. Mm -hmm. yeah, and this is a way of, that we, 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 we work and we understand. Maybe one more question and we can open it up to the floor. Can you uh, maybe speak a little bit more about geometry, which is a, a constant obsession um, I mean, I think more in the later, uh, the last, mm -hmm. I mean, not necessarily the, your earlier works, yeah. but geometry in relationship to the, the predominant program that you designed for, which is museums, right? Um, you were also speaking about the uh, appropriation of the museum afterwards by artists and curators that would happen in Cordoba. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you mentioned it for Cordoba. Yeah. Um, so what is the role of uh, geometry in the context of the museum? Uh, relative to use or performance, shall we say, or, or other aspects uh, that, let's say, your client would ask you to design for? For example, we have to di di distinguish between a museum or an art center. We have been working in both programs. Uh, we haven't shown here other projects of museums. We have done, like, in Valladolid, or in San Gabriel, where we have a, a clear director, a clear direction. We have the collection. We know the conditions, and then this is not a game of, of geometries. Mm -hmm. This is really uh, something that responds to specific situations. In a contemporary art center, in a cons house, uh, which nobody knows yet who is going to act mm -hmm. and what and where and the way, that's a different thing. And that was the point that I wanted to make, and we made when doing the Corvo thing, and later on the competition, some other competitions like the one in, which is that uh, versus the sort of uh, official way of thinking that the best thing is a neutral space, a white box or something, 
and then so everybody can dance, whatever. Uh, when we started to talk to our friends, artists, and we were doing the, the Cordoba project, most of them said, well, I, I don't know why you do this, this museum or center, because what we like is an industrial building to do our own intervention. <laughs> so in a way, we reacted also to that. So we are doing the architecture present, and then the geometry becomes a, a theme. And knowing that this building but might be, as I said, hated by some of them. And then if it's hated, they will do a, a, a box and they will do something inside, no? Well, yes. Because it's an arts and it's a concept, it's mm -hmm. not a museum. So it's a quite different thing, yeah, okay. the way to, we approach it, yeah. There's some questions from the audience. This one, is there a microphone? So, um, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I was very intrigued by your manner of working and the, and the projects you've taken up. Um, I think that your, it seems that your approach is somewhat unusual from what I've um, seen so far. I, um, I come from an archaeology background, and I was really surprised by the amount of, um, of involvement you have with the kind of a depth of time and with the ground plane and, um, and how important it is for you to to collect things and over time and then and use those images and, and things you've seen in your projects and then to use those to find, um, to find new forms, new and powerful forms. And, and, and oddly, this seemed to bring, to me, it brought to mind John Soane um, and his manner of working I mean, 200 years ago. And so I was wondering whether some of this manner of working comes from the sorts of projects, projects that you have done, mostly museums, or whether this comes from collections that you've had since maybe the beginnings of your education. I'm wondering if you could respond to that. Thanks. Hmm. No, I didn't completely understand the question, but I like that you said that you come from an archaeological ground. You know, my, my, my grandfather was an archaeologist. Mm, though he was not really working on the fields, he was the director of a museum in a little town in Spain but he was an archaeologist. I always personally was extremely interested in, in or more than interested, attracted by ruins. No? And uh, ruins, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, they, they explain this idea that is so deeply rooted in architecture. We build, it's about construction, but ruins are also about destruction. I mean, uh, earthquakes and battles and whatever, no? It's construction, destruction, construction, destruction. And then uh, when you see, uh, this was said also by Louis Kahn, no? And the beauty of a building when it's being built or when it's a ruin, no? Uh, there's something parallel between the ruin and being built. And uh, especially because a ruin is something that each of us reinterpret in our minds in different ways. You go to these wings of Marina Alzada and you probably imagine something which is different from what we imagine. No? And so uh, this is extremely architectural. Uh, this is a, this is a, uh, we, we are extremely happy when we have to do a, a project where there is something that was existing. <laughs> because immediately it, it becomes part of the, of, the, of the whole process of the project. But probably I am not answering you because I didn't, <laughs> I didn't understand the question. I'm simply talking what I, what I understood that I was interested. It, it was not the question. <laughs> what was the question? that I finally got to toward the end um, was about um, whether that way of working you have, which deals a lot with um, time depth and with uh, collecting items over time and, and looking for items of reference, um, yeah. whether this comes from, this engagement with context and with collecting comes from the sorts of projects you have done, which have mostly been museums and yeah. which inherently deal mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. uh, long periods of time and with wide varieties of, of, mm -hmm. of objects. Um, or whether this comes from predilections that you've had um, since maybe an early time in your education. Are these things that you've had since the beginning or have they developed over the course of your career? Yeah. Probably it's both as, as I can imagine because it's not only one thing. One belongs to this personal interest, but definitely our education, our background, uh, living in Spain, uh, being linked to, uh, being used today, for example, when we show so often the mosque of Cordoba, it's because as, chil as child, even we, uh, we, we, we are from Madrid, but we were there, we, it was something that you perceive somehow. This is more 
perceptive than than in, than say uh, intellectual. No, I have. I think the perception is very very strong when you do things. No, but uh, probably it's both. Yeah. And and also at the same time, um, th your experience is growing. So you can never say. I mean, uh, maybe it because you, of course you are you are always oriented to the different to the things you like, and and always your experience within with the years it's growing and you are getting more experience and you are getting more in a one direction or the other. But the experiences are different, and those experiences are really the ones that really appear in your projects. And that's why, in a way, you are saying also that our last projects maybe are different, because we are accumulating more experience that we are drawing on those projects in a different way. But I wouldn't, as I, I say exactly what Enrique, is both. I don't think that you can separate them. We have, I understand, time for one more question. Well, I saw this hand first, <laughs> I must say. Hi. Um, I just wanted to thank you very much for, for coming, and it was an uh, inspirational uh, presentation. I kind of wanted to revisit this, like, um, this thing that was talked about, the difference between idea and concept, and whether for you the idea has to have like, um, like a formal dimension to it, like a lot of the image that you showed that was mediating your, your buildings had this, had a strong like formal like content to them. And as students, whether this is important to um, foster this process too. Because I see so many times as students we're afraid of form and we like run to program and just we're like in the idea of concept or whatever. And whether it can make maybe um, the process easier for us if we if we think about form really early in our projects as well. So that's my question. Yes, being platonic idea and form is yes, definitely yeah. very connected. Yeah, but maybe the trick is to talk about words. It, um, it's maybe it's right to talk about idea or concept, or maybe not. What we are interested in is uh, very much in this theme that uh, there are experiences that you get because you live them, or because you l look at them in in, a, in an image or in a. In a in a movie or in a book or you imagine this inform or, are, or trigger or are the sort of poetic image that starts a project. Whether we call it idea or concept or that is, a, is another semantic discuss, discussion. Uh, the example uh, per, probably better of what we show is this building in Madina Talfara, but, but maybe some others. Um, it is not that we want to do a building like a whatever. No? It is like, what if we try to understand how the colleges work? And if we find this, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole idea, if we call it idea, is a process that leads you through the whole process, the whole way. Yeah? This is what we try, which is not always the same. It's not always like that. It's not always so simple, no? But, but, uh, but, it, uh, but it's what we are interested in. Because if this is lacking, then we are bored with architecture. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's only about solving, the, the, the ugly world is to solve problems. If, if we are against to solve problems, we know that the world is full of problems. But, 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 but this is not what moves us. We hope to, to solve problems because we are interested in what we do. And this is a key question. So we don't, we, it, the projects we show here, and, and many, and some others we have, and all we try, uh, make sense only if I can express, uh, we can express it uh, in a way that transmit this idea that was behind. This is something I say, we say very often in the office. Uh, if we start a competition and, and say, at, an, at one point I can say, we don't continue because I could never explain that. I, I could never say what to, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm solving, yes, a program and maybe it's okay, but. Uh, uh, and this is what, uh, but of course the words, uh, and as you say, hey, we like to use idea, but maybe um, maybe you like to use concept, or you like to use, you know, poetry, poetic image. Uh, well, speaking to, to you tonight and hearing you, um, it makes us really understand what it's like, as Arfa Part said, um, architecture is like composing music. I think you've communicated that to us very well. Thank you very much for it. Thank you.